Um, yes, but look, um, Cordelia, thank you for uh, joining us today. Pleasure. Um, lovely to see you. Um, I, I have to ask, where, where are you located at this current point? Because it's a very, very resplendent background. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, not our lovely fancy office in Covent Garden, but in my flat in Putney, which I do like very much, but very much longing to be back in the office in Covent Garden. <laughs> well, in, a, in a way, we've, we, we have our, you know, when, uh, the, the day we're filming this is clearly we have Boris's big announcement tonight. The big day, seven o'clock tonight. So people will have already seen the answer to this before they view, uh, view the, the vodcast or the podcast. But I mean, bearing that in mind, Will you be keen to get back to Covent Garden? Because it is it is a great setup you've got there, and I'm sure you missed all your lovely team and much that we do everything on Zoom. Just um, I, mean, I think I think there's been a definite societal shift, hasn't there? And the way we all work will change. But yes, very much looking forward to going back to the office. And I think the whole team is looking forward to being back together. It's those moments, isn't it, around the coffee machine or walking down the corridor or walking down the stairs together when you have that chat that gives you that bit of buzz and you come up with some idea together that you can't possibly do over a pre-arranged Zoom. Um, and we, you know, we're, as a team, we love to be together and we have fun. And I think some of the fun has been lost through COVID. But nevertheless, we are going to go back to the office and we're going to retain having an office at Fieldhouse because okay. we think it's really important to still have humans together but we are going to change the way we work okay. so we're going to start having um, two days a week that are our core days Tuesdays and Thursdays when the whole team will be required to be in nine mm -hmm. to six um, but Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays it'll be up to the individual whether they want to work flexibly, be in the office, be at home, be in Starbucks, wherever. Um, and obviously you need to come in for meetings and key moments. Mm -hmm. But we think in that way, we can make sure we're all together enough, but people retain some of the flexibility that we have all enjoyed during this extraordinary time. It'll be great right. to see as well, you know, the reduce in staff burnout and stuff like that, just yeah. by giving people the option to, you know, if not feeling up to the commute and that sort of thing, you know, just work from home, right? Um, so we always work from home on a Friday and we have done that for nine years um and so there's always been quite a big benefit of working at Fieldhouse that we could be at home on Fridays and so in effect I feel like we're just extending that to the Monday and the Wednesday as well um but yeah I think that's right I think even when we were just doing four days in the office everyone knowing they had that one day where you could take deliveries you can pop to the post office uh you haven't got to get up and like put your face on you can just <laughs> Be a bit more cash and I think that suits people nicely to have that a day or two a week for sure. Great and I suppose there's been a lot written and we'll obviously dig into Fieldhouse and who you are and what a great founder you are in a, in a sec but just before we do wrapping up the the point about the going back to the office I find it quite strange the news particularly over the weekend about some employers stipulating that staff must have been vaccinated before they return to an office which clearly is a real infringement of you know personal rights right. I yeah. but, so I'm, I'm just curious any perspectives from from field house on that I mean, I would encourage everybody who has offered it to have the vaccination 100%. I'm totally pro-vax, but I still think it is a matter of personal choice. And we protect ourselves by being vaccinated ourselves, just as we would with our children. So we certainly wouldn't be um, putting any kind of rules around that into returning to the office at Fieldhouse. Also remembering that most of the team are well under 30 yeah. and young and fit and healthy. And so in the sort of less lower risks category um, than certainly you or I <laughs> and so um, <laughs> so we won't be putting any rules in but I, I think it's a good moment to say if you're offered it please take it because it protects everybody. Okay. Great good 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 point so Fieldhouse Ta tell us more Cordelia it's it's an amazing success story I've loved it engaging and working with you for many years but for people who don't know Fieldhouse what 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 what's it all about? Well so my background was in corporate and financial PR and I did that for 
more years than I'm going to admit, um, in-house and agency. And I was working with big companies where, you know, the, what the PR work did would fiddle around with the edges of share prices and, um, and I would say relatively low impact work. And I realized about 10, 12 years ago that actually if you work with growing businesses, the impact PR can have can be well, life-changing for those businesses. And so that's so much more interesting and much more fun and much more valuable to the people you're working with. So PR becomes a, a core part of your investment in your business, not just a fluffy bit around the edge. So I was working at a company prior to this that exited to Hotwire PR and uh, both of those were tech and growth businesses. And Hotwire went straight into, into tech again and realized that I'd become a bit of an entrepreneur myself, working with all these entrepreneurs all the time. And I couldn't really go back to working for a big agency. And my clients were saying to me, please go and do this yourself. My old team was saying, if you do it for yourself, we will come and work for you. Um, and journalists were saying, what on earth are you doing? Go and do this for yourself. <laughs> so having never intended to be an entrepreneur, I took the big jump in April, 2012 and launched Field House with the specific goal of working with high growth tech entrepreneurs and helping them through the life cycle of their business. So everything from launch to seed rounds, various funding rounds, um, customer acquisition, team acquisition, geographical expansion, all the way through to exit, whatever that might be, or IPO. And seeing a business through that life cycle is really exciting. And of course, the joy as a PR agency is the difference is we can actually help so that's that was sort of the concept behind launching it and the, the the extension of that though has been that we work with venture capital firms as well and you can't possibly understand the life cycle of a tech entrepreneur without understanding the investment world as well so we're very fortunate that we actually work with nine different vcs now and over the years have worked with countless others um and so we work with them as well as with the tech entrepreneurs. So we understand both sides of the cycle. So understanding what the, what the, what the VCs are looking for and what's hot and what's not and what's coming through. And at the same time, understanding what the entrepreneurs are looking for from their investors. So we're able to help on that side too. We've also now started working with professional service firms. So law firms, accountancy firms, corporate financiers, banks, who all want a piece of this action. With accelerators like Wira and, and Space Camp, with um, corporates, Jaguar Land Rovers in Motion Ventures, for example. Um, and then, of course, the final piece of the action is working with events and influencers like Notwix. Um, so we partner with various key events, and that means that we have little bit of editorial influence perhaps we can get our clients on those stages and also we get access to those rooms that no other PR people would be in. Yeah. So we like to think that, P that Fieldhouse now sits in the middle of the tech ecosystem, tech and venture ecosystem, um, and sort of pulls everyone together and joins a few dots. Uh, so it's very exciting. We are going to be 10 years old in 2022. So look out for a nice big party. Um, and we're currently 24 people, as referenced already, office in Covent Garden. Um, but yes, going great guns and still enjoying it. Yeah. Did, did you find that, um, you know, when you started nine years ago, that founders got it immediately and it clicked? Or have you had to sort of educate the founder ecosystem on the benefits of early PR um, and how it just compounds over the life cycle of their business? I think a bit of both, if I'm really honest. I think there is some education to be done on how PR can help and that it's not just a bit of fluff that actually can help the bottom line and the impact that it can have and the way we can help change businesses from their messaging and positioning to how they tell their story um, and that those elements can change the direction the business goes. It can attract, as I said already, investors, partners, team, and it can make all the difference in the world. So there is that education to be done. But I also think that founders were crying out for some help. And so sometimes you just start explaining what you do and they just go, oh, this is amazing. Nobody else understands growth businesses. There are a lot of good PR agencies that do tech, that do corporate, that do financial, but they don't understand growing businesses. And so specializing in that has been 
well, I mean, it's fundamental to our business. Um, and the entrepreneurs recognize that because so, uh, so few other PR people speak their language. And I suppose with that in mind, Cordelia, you have the Basecamp offering, which I think is purely targeted at, at, at founders at that yes, um, yeah. So I don't know for the audience if you could maybe tell us more about that. Sure. So um, <laughs> having said we work with all the different sorts of entrepreneurs at all the different stages, but we realised a couple of years ago that as our business had grown and our fees had gone up and we'd grown up, we were working with fewer and fewer startups because they couldn't afford to work with Fieldhouse. And however many deals we would do for particular entrepreneurs who were friends of Fieldhouse or friends of friends, you can't say you actually work in the tech ecosystem without working with actual tech startups. So we're trying to figure out how we could service tech startups without literally losing money our end. And um, those margins have got to work. And it came up with this idea of Basecamp. The idea of Basecamp is that startup founders can have all the opportunities that come through from working with a PR agency like ours. So a journalist looking for comment on a fintech story or that these particular awards are now open for entry or that there's a speaking slot available at another event or that we have a discount code for for something all these different opportunities that come through um, which is standard part of employing a PR agency and we send those opportunities to the members of Basecamp Unfortunately, they then have to do the work themselves. <laughs> so we send them the opportunity and all the contact details or links as, as, as required. And they then fulfill that opportunity themselves or not. But that's over to them. And we're able to do that at a really uh, good value price point so that um, it becomes affordable for startup founders. Because it's really important that those startup founders start doing PR early. It is how they're going to break through and reach audiences that they can't possibly reach through any other avenue. So Basecamp was our solution to continue working, continuing working with early stage, well, proper early stage startups, not even just startups. Um, and so far, so good. good. I think it, it, that's a really valid point you make there, Cordelia, that yeah it, it it's it is very much about awareness and when we come across some founders um and they've got amazing technologies brilliant teams you know they're growing traction commercially and, and you you kind of you know they, they they are hyper focused and we have to sometimes talk say that look you know that's brilliant but no one actually knows about your fantastic technology and your yeah. product and yeah. you've got to get out there and tell people and yeah. PR is the key ingredient uh, and to, to, to drive that so I completely agree with you that it's you've got to shout from the hills founders because there's a lot of founders out there and I suppose that moves me into my next question which is you know 2021 is upon us we're not nearly two months in <laughs> even yeah. though it's kind of flown by as we've all been sort of stuck to our zooms but yeah. you know how, how's 2021 shaping up with those new founders and potential business are you optimistic about the the next 12 months or 10 months i suppose I mean yeah absolutely we are in a really fortunate position that the world of tech has actually sped up in this time period so you know in 2020 and it's i know it's not i'm not the first person to say this but tech has been adopted at a rate un as unheard of before and as un unexpected we could never have anticipated it and that's been really exciting to see and so founders have been having to keep up with that pace and PR can be part of the way they can grow and attract the funding and attract the partners, attract the customers that they need um, in order to keep that moving forward. So very exciting 2020 in terms of the speed of tech adoption. Mm -hmm. And the same thing has happened with PR because I think there was still a lot of focus on marketing as being a very simple way to do their people there reach out into markets because it's very measurable. And so that makes it comforting for people. So they can say, we've sent our email out to 2000 people that's great, but they're 2,000 people you already know. Mm. Whereas with PR, you can actually say, right, what I want to do is become better known in FMCG space, and so I'm going to target publications that are in that area, and then I will reach people who I would never have been able to reach otherwise. 
and it works. And I think people are now seeing that. Again, the adoption of PR has been, has been great. So 2021 is shaping up really well for us. We had our biggest ever quarter in Q4 2020. Wow. Not saying the rest of the year was so great, <laughs> but by Q4, things were looking up. And, um, and so we see the same thing going forward in 2021. We have incoming new business every week. That's We're doing right. no marketing for ourselves mm -hmm. and we have three or four leads a week just come into us saying from mm -hmm. kind people like you and other friends. I think I sent, sent you a couple over the we weekend. Have, we have. <laughs> and that's I'll scratch your back. <laughs> and, uh, we all continue to scratch one another's backs, Chris. <laughs> well, that's, it's good and, and it shows how we both are working so hard to bring, you know, our, our, our businesses to, to to the audience and, and yeah. to successfully help them gain opportunities to to yeah. grow so so great on that front i i suppose where we first met all those years ago were, were through some of those wonderful events that you used to um be renowned for so i think pitch in the palace was one of one of them that we, it was a, a great event in its heyday um i'm just curious you know obviously we've had the advent of hop in and which is a, a real, I suppose, virtual winner in, in the fastly yep. fast moving sort of virtual digital uh, Zoom type space. And what, what's your advice that you're giving some of those founders or some of those VCs that are thinking, OK, second half, we want to do a big glitzy event and we want to get everyone back into the offices and, you know, connapse and, you know, and, 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 and showcase ourselves face to face with people rather than on a screen. So just what's, what's the thought process there? Wait, just mm. wait. <laughs> I really, really recommend waiting. I think we are still going to be socially distancing for some time right through into August, September. And we want to have that. We want to be the first to have one of those big events and have everybody together, have everybody together again. I can't wait, but that won't be until September. So for now, I think we stick to our online events and they are working well, you know, Chris, we are able now to attract people from all over the world to our events. It's really exciting to see. I mean, Silicon Valley comes to the UK last year in the autumn was attracting up to a thousand people watching each session who could never possibly have been here otherwise because these guys were in the valley and in Asia. It's absolutely brilliant to see that happening. So there are some pluses of this bizarre online world we've had to move towards. Um, and one of them is that we can have a wider audience at our events than we ever could before. Do you, so think, uh, do you think you'll run both of them in tandem going forward then? I'm just going to say, I think the next step will be hybrid events. I think you'll be able to join events online and in real life for a very long time. I think the same will be true of meetings, that it'll become normal to have a couple of people on a screen and a couple of people around a table, which of course international companies have been doing for years. Um, but I think, I think it will all become normal to have hybrid events. So in answer to your basic question about when we should do this and how long we have to wait, I think we should all hold off, stick to our guns on online events and, and hope very, hope beyond hope that come September, we can actually hold some conferences. But at that time to also understand that people are complicated and, you know, your point about people and their rules going, offices going, having rules around COVID vaccines, people are going to be scared for some time to come about being in groups. And so by offering a hybrid model, I think we're actually being kind as well as being sensible. Yeah, it's good. I, I, I'm curious as well. I, I think, you, you know, the, the perhaps before COVID, there had come a point where there were so many like conferences happening each week, every day, sometimes all around oh. Europe. And, 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 you know, and I thought that was great and really reflective of, of the momentum. But it seemed to me that there were a bit too many of these big, stellar conferences and maybe people had lost sight a bit through those but I'm just curious do you, do you think it will be next year that we start to get the sort of you know tech crunch disrupts and the Europas and the things where it's it's a real celebration and it's actually that point where we're celebrating where we are by all coming together and there could be hundreds or thousands of people in a room again would, would that be realistic? I think next year, yes. I mean, I think events like Slush and others have announced they're going to be online. Uh, Mobile World Congress was supposed to be this summer. It's supposed to be in June. I can't imagine that going ahead, 
really, um, maybe wrong. Um, so I think we could count on these big cornerstone events next yeah. year. Um, again, for the point I was making earlier, that I think people would be too scared to be in massive groups like that. I couldn't yeah. imagine walking into a room now of sort of 10,000 people like you would at Mobile World Congress or at a Slash or at a Web Summit. You know, it'd be terrifying. So I, I think it's, it's next year. But I, can you imagine how exciting it's going to be when we are able to do that again? <laughs> get on a plane and go to a hotel wow. and then get your badge for the event. Wow, I'd, for the event. I, I, I'd wish for that one day. Come <laughs> into people as you walk around. It's going to be amazing. Well, in a way, that's it's going to be an even higher pressure to execute on those events because people's expectations are going to be quite quite high right i've gone through all this effort to go to the physical event it better really knock my socks off okay. uh, and i suspect there'll be some consolidation as well won't there all of those different events that we're running can't yeah. all go on it was becoming saturated yeah. so i think, I think there, there will be a few businesses that have, have actually unfortunately come to a close because because the, there were too many i think yeah I think that's right. I think we'll all be more careful about what we what we bother to go to and what we spend money on, what we spend the time, what we, I suppose, risk our safety to go to. Um, and I think I think I think there will be fewer, but maybe Anthony's point better events. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of a bit of a reflection in in a way of what we've seen during the, the 2020 and 2021 20, in terms of the the founders that we we've, we've worked we work we will continue to work with that we have found that there are fewer sort of it coming to us in the ecosystem and a bit like you we, we do tend to get recommended business but that's a good thing in a way because the, the ones that we're working with i think now are because they've navigated covid the yeah. challenges they've got product market fit they've grown their businesses and they're getting to that next stage which we're helping halo affect them up to a you know a bridging round or a series a or yeah. you know you know helping them grow through our advice and you know i think that's sort of probably mirrored in the world of events you know in a way so yeah. you know so in, interesting and then I, you know we talked about founders a lot and and naturally we you met a large number of founders i always ask this question because i i, I kind of been in the, the seat where you you see some real clangers from various <laughs> in the meeting and you're just thinking you know we had one one guest on recently who was a vc who was saying just don't lie don't tell us something that's not true about you will be found out yeah you're going to get stitched up eventually and, and so i just kind of you know for the founders that are listening any any particular advice i suppose framed around the world of pr or or, or your life at fieldhouse yeah the world around, it, it really is how you tell your story and it would be great to get a pr agency to help you with that but if you can't then get a friend to listen to your story what you need to be able to do is tell your tell tell people what you do in the space of two minutes in words that your granny would understand if you can do that, you're basically on to a winner. <laughs> no jargon. <laughs> no jargon. You would be able to say, well, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and what's the market for that? How are you solving it? And who are you solving it with? So what's your team? And if you can get those three things across in two minutes, using no jargon in terms that your granny would understand, then that's a winner. When we run messaging sessions, which is the first thing we do really when we start with any new client, one of the questions, we go through a whole set of what are your USPs and you know what are the strengths and weaknesses of the business and all this stuff that you'd expect. But really the best question is, when you're in the pub, how do you describe what you do? Hopefully and that, when you're sober in the pub. Hopefully when you're sober. Although I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but that tends to be the best answer. Because when you're explaining to people who don't necessarily understand everything about what you do, what you do, then you'll use language that, that, that is easily understood. And that works better. And it certainly works better for the media. And if you think about a journalist who, well, and Chris, of all people you know, having been at Bloomberg all those years, but no journalist, even a tech journalist, cannot understand how every type of tech works or what even every word in tech means. And so 
you mustn't you mustn't complicate things too much even for the media <laughs> yeah great answer I, I, I really really good last answer um just on the bc side of life again you know you mentioned the nine bcs that you work with um what's the sort of advice for venture capitalists if they want to really kind of work and build their pr or any kind of banana skins you've seen that you'd want to alert, uh, alert them to and and in that the, process the, the key for vcs is to distinguish themselves in the market everybody has money there's more money in the uk now than there has been for a long time everyone knows this so what is the beyond finance message that's really what it comes down to and there doesn't have to be having a lovely office and offering a bit of working space it's how you can actually help your founders and help your portfolio so figuring out how you can do that and getting that message across and why you're different to other VCs is really what's fundamental because what you're looking for is quality deal flow not quantity of deal flow if you put out a press release saying we've raised a fund everyone's going to send you an email wanting some money that's what they're going to do but if in that email you not only explain why you're better than other VCs or why you're just different from other VCs but you make very clear what sort of businesses you're going to invest in, what sectors you're interested in, what stage you're interested in, what type of founders you're interested in, and then you'll get the right sort of deal flow that hopefully will be much more useful. And that means that the relationship between both sides will be happier long term. Mm -hmm. So distinguish yourself and be very clear about your special areas. But the final area is also personality because in the end it's a people business yes it's about money but it's actually a people business it's about relationships and so individual partners at VCs having profile is also very helpful and people will follow those individuals around as they move from VC to VC same as PR people by the way <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting you say you made that point about uh, people and and the dynamic of en engaging the, you know if I look at if, you know I've been asked that question around not wicks and I was thinking about this uh, funnily enough over the weekend and, and it's kind of probably about 60 percent of the founders that we we meet um I'd say we've, there's something there there's a chemistry we like them they like us it's a really good high level conversation that we have and maybe evolves into business and then I'd probably say I call this my 60 40 rule that we probably didn't have about another 20 percent that because I'm an old git and they're like 22 we don't really have a lot of commonality and in, in, in kind of the way we think and act and, and the interests that we have um but there's a there's a respect that is is quite clear and, and from what we do and, and what they do and the knowledge that we have and the experience that we can share yeah. and then you have an, the final 20 percent that I, I personally and i'd love to hear your view you, you just kind of meet this particular person male or female and you just think there is not a cat in house charles <laughs> i'm gonna get work with you i mean i just i just can't you clearly don't like me or you don't like my business or there's just no chemistry and I, and I suppose for, for when I used to have previous careers for big usual you know em, employers and not so much at Bloomberg but when when I was in the investment banking days you you would have been you know you were told to suck it up and work with the 20 percent that you think you don't have any respect for or you don't really like and I mean I think the beauty of designing your own business which you have Cordelia is that sort of Probably that 60 40 rule that we, we might have, say, at Notwitz. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. It's one of the absolute joys of running your own business that you can choose who not to work with. <laughs> that can be because you don't get on with them or because they don't understand what you're doing or how you can help them. Or it can be because you, the, the technology isn't that interesting. You know, you can make choices in all sorts of different ways. But what it comes down to for us really is that we think the people will be fun to work with and treat us with kindness and respect yeah. and we have fired clients over the years we actually fired a client last year in 2020 which was quite a big thing to do yeah. um, because if they don't treat the team properly then we're not interested in working with them Absolutely. but the best relationships are based on as i say respect which means that we are amazed by what this person and company is doing and really excited and mm -hmm. driven to help them because we think it's so brilliant what they're doing and that they in return understand that we are also going to help them and that we have expertise mm -hmm. 
so that it becomes a real two-way thing. We, we, we like and appreciate one another, even if there is a financial transaction going on. Yeah. That's when it works the best, isn't it? And when they appreciate us because they know how hard we're working and that we're actually adding value to their business and that we understand and appreciate them because we're so amazed by what they're doing that we're desperate to work with them. Mm. That's the best way around. Okay, great. Um, so, oh, hello, someone was beeping then. Um, but um, I want to ask a bit, um, it, I suppose it's a slightly macroeconomic question, and I don't really know quite what to believe at the moment, but much has been written about, what, 900,000 people currently furloughed in London alone. Furlough ends in end of April, I think. Or, or employers take it off or the government take it off or, or however it works but just you know could there be a point because some people are predicting oh just unemployment won't really you know um, you know rush up and, and have horrific figures and I think that there's been a bit of a momentum that it's kind of not going to be as bad in recent press over the last week but you know you've started a business I've started a business Anthony started a business um you know is it the case that look if you really do want to start a business just go for it and and unemployment might be the cause of that but just I'm curious you know what would be your sort of advice to someone who's thinking oh, I'm gonna I hate my job I've hated it even more because of COVID it's showing me how much I hate it and I've been been given the opportunity for a redundancy Shall I go for it? So what would Cordelia's sort of top tips be for that, that moment of like, how do I take that plunge? Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to have the idea, don't you? So you can't just start a business from nothing. It's got to be you have some expertise in some area or you have some amazing idea that you think you can build. That's what it's got to come from. Not everybody can just turn around and start a business. And you also have to be a certain type of person, don't you? You've got to have some kind of risk appetite. I didn't realise that I had before I did this, but you have to have some kind of risk appetite because it is a risk. You know, your first loan is against your house. <laughs> um, and that's it's a big deal. Um, and and I and I think it's it's weighing that up against the ease of. A monthly salary. However, to your point about the large numbers of unemployment, if you can do it and you do have that idea, of course, jump in and take the risk because you have nothing to lose at that point. You can give it a go. You can always still get a job later. When I launched Fieldhouse, I told my husband I had a very small amount of money saved aside for this business. And, and I told him if after three months I haven't made a single penny in revenue, that money would be gone and I would stop doing it and I would go and get myself another job because I know I'm employable. I know I can get myself another job. So, you know, just, just understand that it's going to take a little while to build it up, yeah. have an idea, have some expertise and then go for it. Yeah. I do, however, think it's not going to pray, but I really don't think it's going to be as bad as we all fear yeah. in that the, the numbers, as you say, in the media over the last week have been that most a lot of the companies are expecting to hire we've just hired two people we're looking to hire a third things are going pretty well mm -hmm. obviously hospitality and leisure are the industry suffering the most but as soon as hospitality and leisure is allowed to open up again then those businesses yeah. will fly right because There's... we'll all be there desperate to be yeah. at restaurants and in nightclubs and mm -hmm. at the theater so it seems it seems to be quite a it's a flick on and off isn't it with these weird lockdowns it's something we've never experienced before and you know Boris said he's shocked by how difficult how easy it is to lock us down and how difficult it is to open us back up again which he's found a really surprising and interesting sort of economic and social element of this um so it has to be that when we are all allowed back and restaurants are open and pubs are open that those jobs are still there because we all still desire it and where there is demand there will be supply and so it has to all come back yeah it's going to be a tough year isn't it but it has to all come back at some point there's um, definitely there's definitely a correlation between the speed of the vaccine rollout and how bad the unemployment numbers will be because as you've just pointed out what's that 
I've had my COVID vaccination. <laughs> um, but I also agree with you as well. If you're going to take a risk, make sure it's a calculated risk. Don't just go in blind and expect that everything will just turn out because, right? Do your research, take your time it's because hard, it's right? a major jump. It's really hard. It's really hard, isn't it? It's, it's long hours. You've got nobody to turn to. You never switch off. You never switch off. Mm. You know, my, my team are really sweet and often say to me, you know, you're the hardest working boss we've mm. ever had. Or, you know, you're working all hours. And it's because there is no choice. Yeah. The best way <laughs> I've heard it described is entrepreneurs are the only people that are willing to work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm going to use that now. <laughs> you're welcome to it. I, I didn't come up with it. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, so I, I suppose I've got a couple a couple of last questions. One is just hearing you speak so passionately, Cordelia, about the business. Um, just, you know, what, what's your ambition? Where do you want to take Fieldhouse to? And then the second question is, ha have you, and I'm just curious here, have you ever taken on investment into your business like, I suppose, a traditional founder would in, in the world of tech and, and or, or is that on, on the horizon? Um, so I'll answer the second question first, we'll say it sort of makes sense. Um, no, we've taken no investment. One of my proudest moments though was when we were pitching a VC, I won't say who it was, mm -hmm. and we did the pitch and we came out of it and it went really well. And then the senior partner asked me to stay back for a few minutes. And I was hoping to say, you know, you're hired type thing. And instead this person said, you have a fantastic business. And if you decide to look for funding, can I be your first phone call? Mm. And I was, I was absolutely delighted and very flattered, but, but no, we've taken, we've taken no investment thus far. And did you get them as a client in the end as well? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. <laughs> Funny <laughs> that. <laughs> and they're one of my absolute favorites. Um, yeah. But, um, but yes, so no, no, no investment so far. And, um no plans to at the moment anyway um plans for the future this is, this is the sort of billion dollar question right because i love working at and running field house and i hope and think that my team loves working at field house and yeah. i know the senior team are extremely motivated to continue working at field house and to help grow it so that's really it's a really fun journey to be on mm. and we're able to choose our clients choose the people we work with which is fantastic too right mm. um choose um partners like you guys to work yeah. with mm -hmm. and and with and we enable flexible working we're going to do these core days back in the office we have fantastic parties we all get on really well we really enjoy what we do and yes it's really hard work but actually we love it yeah. so i'm not going to use the word lifestyle business because it's not much of a lifestyle considering how hard we all work mm -hmm. um but it is a great business and people and, and we and we love it so i think and i also think it's having an impact on the space that we work in definitely is really exciting yeah. so I don't want to stop working at Fieldhouse. I don't want to stop running Fieldhouse. I enjoy it and I think the people around us enjoy it too. Right. But obviously I'm not going to do it forever. Yeah. So then what's the big, what's the, what do we do? You know, we've had over the years, I think six approaches from different companies to buy the business. Wow. Well, I've seen these buyouts you guys, and you know, the pain of the earnout for five years, <laughs> <laughs> you know and 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 also the truth is that in a service industry like ours the multiples you're looking at are just not huge you know unfortunately we work with all these amazing tech businesses but we're not a tech business we are a service business and so the multiples are low you know two three so it's a difficult it's a difficult decision what to do for now we are on a growth path we'll be 10 next year we have some big plans for that Maybe I can tell you all about that next year. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but for now, we're growing and just being excited and happy and, and feeling very lucky to be doing this. And I think in a few years, we'll decide what we're going to do with it. I'm definitely going to see my daughter through her education first anyway. <laughs> Lady first, yes. Um, no, well, look, great, great insights. And you touched on 
lifestyle, um, one question we always like to ask our, our guests, uh, outside of the, the baby, the field house, what's keeping you busy at the moment? And also, what are you watching? <laughs> I mean, in normal times, I'd be able to tell you all sorts of fun things that would keep me busy. But of course, I'm basically in this room 24-7. <laughs> but I also have a 14, about to be 15-year-old daughter. She keeps me very busy. Um, well, trying to get her out of bed. Um, <laughs> half term's over and she's back at school now in her bedroom, so that's a good thing. We also got a puppy about five weeks ago, very exciting. He is called Thor and he's been wonderful for the family, but also wonderful getting me out and making me go for a walk every day and all that kind of stuff, which is brilliant. And having another excited and happy thing in the house has been a joy. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, in the end, the relaxation comes in the form of watching Netflix <laughs> and maybe a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> and so, well, so in terms of what, we, what I'm watching, my goodness, so I really enjoyed, slightly offbeat, The Family. You won't, have, you won't have heard of it, but you should look it up. It's about a little boy who's nine and he goes missing. He's, he find, well, anyway, he goes missing mm -hmm. and um, he reappears 10 years later. And it's about what happened to him and what happens to the family and the time that he's gone and when he comes back. So that wow. was really interesting program. I really enjoyed that. Is that, and ne that's like, ne Netflix, is it? Netflix. Or, yeah, okay. Netflix. Wow. And then I've watched all the classics everyone's been watching, you know, Bridgerton and the like. Yeah. But because I am massively interested in politics, mm -hmm. um, when I can't find anything to watch of any of a certain level, I just always revert back to the West Wing. Mm -hmm. okay. I That's absolutely love the West Wing. So I watched it, I watched the whole series in lockdown one. <laughs> and then about two weeks ago, in I watched it all again. <laughs> I, well, I went back to it, so now I'm in series two. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, like, political dramas have kind of been ruined by the last, you know, period of recent events. Because then, like, House of Cards was... In America, it, that's the case. I even mean, here, America. it's... Uh, even here, it was pretty pretty unbelievable what's happened in the last sort of few years. Um, I, think you, I think you got the gold medal last year, or this year. Yeah, America. De well, talking about dramatic things happening there on in political dramas, did you watch Designated Survivor? Yeah, I watched the first few episodes of the first season, but like I said, they've kind of gone off for, for me personally. Like House of Cards, I thought was doing really well until it was like, how do you compete with that administration? <laughs> Yeah, you see, I watched the Bart administration in the West Wing just thinking, yes, that's the way it should be. <laughs> Whoever's in the White House. But of course, things are looking better now in the actual White House. So that's a good thing. The world's mm. looking better. But... The world is looking better. Yeah. The hope is there, right? We're at the end of this tunnel. Yes, and, and hopefully, Bobo, seven o'clock tonight, you will lay out the plan. So um, look, it's, it's always been a joy to talk to you. Cordelia and thank, thank you for your amazing insights really enjoyed catching up and I don't know if Anthony has any last burning questions or we will say our goodbyes and let you go to your lunch break I suppose and feed the dog <laughs> no, <laughs> until we meet again and hear what you guys have got planned for the 10-year anniversary that'll be great well listen thank you so much for having me I really appreciated it and great to chat to you both and All thank right. you for all your support Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.